Welcome to 5 Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is John Vroman. John is a husband and father who also happens to be the founder of FrontRowDads.com and host of the Front Row Dads podcast. His mission is to help high-performing entrepreneurial men be family men with businesses, not businessmen with families. In addition to his business and family, John founded FrontRowFoundation.org in 2005, a charity that creates unforgettable moments for individuals who are braving life-threatening illnesses. Today we're going to be discussing his book, The Front Row Factor, Transform Your Life with the Art of Moment Making. Let's ask John five good questions. But first, I'm happy to announce my literary debut, The Rebel Allocator, is now available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. You could say it's about time. I've been pouring my heart into this book for more than three years. A well-known SoCal billionaire received an early copy of the book and actually called me to say he enjoyed the story and was adamant that I get it made into a movie. Talk about a surreal experience getting 20 minutes on the phone with one of my heroes. My friend Tobias Carlyle had this to say. Jacob Taylor has written a modern-day investment classic. The Rebel Allocator is reminiscences of a stock operator for value investors. It's a fictionalized retelling of the lessons in The Intelligent Investor in an accessible page-turner. If you want to learn how to invest like Warren Buffett by sitting at his knee, this is the book for you. Wow, how flattering is that? I was blown away when he sent me that. I've created dozens of ad-free author interviews over the last five years and never asked for anything in return. If you've gotten any value out of these efforts, please do me a personal favor and pick up a copy of The Rebel Allocator. I promise you won't regret it. And now, on with the show. Welcome back to the program. My guest today is John Vroman, and he is the author of The Front Row Factor, Transform Your Life with the Art of Moment Making. Hey, John, thanks for taking the time to let us ask you five good questions. Hey, man. So good to be here. So the first thing, uh, as we're kind of getting into question number one, is that I absolutely love this foundation that you started. Uh, and I don't, I wouldn't say it that I'm jealous of it, because uh, that would imply that like I want to be doing it instead of you doing it. But I love the fact that someone is doing it, uh, and I think it's such a great idea. So maybe you could explain a little bit of how the Front Row Foundation came about and what you guys do. Yeah. So uh, first, I'll start with uh, what we do. And rather than telling you what we do, I I love to tell you a quick story about somebody that we help because I think that's that's just better. It's more emotional to understand, you know, the the why behind it. Um, so I'll, I'll take you back to 2007 when I was uh, we had just started the organization, and one of my buddies, John, walked up to me and said, "Hey, I have a friend whose daughter is battling a brain tumor. Her name." is Sophie and she's about four years old and I know that you started this uh, this charity to help people create these incredible experiences that lift their spirits and take them away from you know being in the hospital and just celebrate their life right and put them with their friends and their family where they can laugh and have joy and uh, uh, my response was uh, you know tell me about the the little girl he said she's a raving Kelly Clarkson fan and, uh, you know, I, I, the more I learned about her, the more I fell in love. Now it was interesting as I thought, how much of a fan could you be at four right. <laughs> natural question that comes up, especially if you have kids. And what I learned was that she would cry every time, uh, her mom would turn off the Kelly Clarkson music and, um, they would have Kelly Clarkson dance parties and she knew the words to the songs. It was really like, it was a beautiful connection and really lifted this girl. Well, we created this incredible day with the help of all of our friends and our family. We raised the money. We got the tickets. We sent them, you know, off to dinner and they had a wonderful experience and off to the show. And uh, I'm skipping over a lot of the details, but I think that you get the spirit of what will happen in a moment when I share with you that she was at the event. She was at the concert. She had a great time. She sang her heart out. And at the end, um, they thought it was all over, but we had based on a a wonderful connection of my friend John Rowland, who wrote the book Giftology. Uh, He had a connection to Kelly Clarkson's crew and um, got us backstage. So we got a chance to introduce Kelly to little Sophie. And uh, she freak out? Freaked out. Yeah, it was awesome. In fact, she was like asleep in her mother's arms when Kelly walked in and she goes, hey, y'all. And the, and little Sophie just heard that voice and just woke up, turned around and they locked eyes. And it, we have pictures of that. Um, that photograph actually is is just about five feet from where I sit on my wall. 
And I look at that every day and it reminds me of the purpose of this charity. And the purpose of this charity is to create these incredible moments where people can step away from, uh, in her case, you know, what is a daily routine of being in the hospital, getting blood drawn, uh, multiple surgeries, and, uh, and just to go out and be and have fun with your family. And her mom and dad were there and her brother was there and it was just a wonderful day. Um, and you know, we, we underestimated the impact of the memory when we, when we did this initially. Um, but something happened later that would profoundly change the way I'd see our impact. And that was that her mom, uh, told us, uh, or, or one of our staff members had gone, um, to visit the family and Sophie wasn't doing well. And then shortly after that, a couple of weeks later, Sophie had taken her final breath. This was actually eight weeks after the event she had passed away. And we were obviously all heartbroken and crushed by the news. Um, some of our team went to her funeral and they reported back that they, when they walked up to her casket there, uh, Sophie had her VIP badge around her neck. Oh, wow. And the fact that her mother chose to bury her daughter with this VIP badge what said so much about what we were choosing to do to support people and love on people and lift people um, that I was at that point committed for life to creating these moments. So now that's what we do. We, we create these experiences for kids and adults who have a life threatening illness to go to the event of their dreams. And, you know, we do everything in our power to get them in the front row uh, to do it. And that's, that's what we do. That's amazing. I like that's I had chills through that story. <laughs> what uh, I I still do, by the way, and that's twelve years later. Yeah. What? Um, <clears throat> how is that? How have the things that you've learned in running this this program uh, impacted your own life? Yeah. What have you learned uh, from that? So glad you asked that because a couple years ago, um, it became apparent to me that there was a lot you could learn about living life from people who are fighting for it. It would, there were constantly stories showing up of people that we were helping that we walked away with so much wisdom as a result of something they said or did. I'll give you an example. So, um, this one woman, Nikki, she was, um, battling breast cancer and she was a, a big fan of the Dallas Cowboys and we took her to the event. And it was actually in the limousine. I was with her and she had um, said, hey, she was telling me a story about how sometimes when she goes into restaurants and whatnot, that people will look at her. And she said in her words, it was they would look at me kind of with this look of disgust because I had lost my hair and I was going through this radiation and this chemo and I didn't, you know, my skin was different. And she said, and uh, and ultimately it makes me happy. Like, and I said, <laughs> Yeah, I just I was like a record scratch and I thought, you know, tell tell me more about that. What do you mean? And she said, "Well, if they look at me that way, that must mean that they don't have any clue as to what I'm going through because they've never been through it and they certainly don't know somebody they love that's been through it because if they did, they would know this look. They'd know what was going on." So the fact that they're they don't know that and they might be looking at me that way. I'm just like, hey, I'm grateful you don't understand this situation. And I just that that mindset, that empowered mindset was just one of the many examples, the things that were taught to me. So a couple of years ago, our team sat down and said, what if we were to tell the stories of these recipients and what we were learning and tell their stories in a book? Um, co a collection. And what if we look for the pattern? What if we saw what was really at work here? Like what is happening with front row? Like we were doing it because we just wanted to make a difference, right? Like right. it was really simple. It was very pure. It was like, well, let's just make people happy, you know? Yeah. And, and, and then what was, what re revealed over time was there was more to it. We started to see a pattern emerge of like, we, re we didn't recognize in the beginning the power of hope, right? When we would tell somebody they're going to go to the event that how hope brings the power of possibility into the present moment. We, we didn't fully appreciate the power of celebration. We didn't appreciate people looking back on those events. And we certainly didn't appreciate how impactful it would be to be away from their illness for a day. So those were the things that we were learning and we started writing about it. And the book came out a couple years ago and it's done pretty well. Yeah, no, and that's, uh, <clears throat> there's so many things baked into the book that are kind of really make you reassess your own choices a lot of times like what are you spending your time on and what are you getting upset That's about the big one. Uh, yeah and and tying into that question number two is um, about stress and one of the interesting things in, that uh, you cited was a 
a, some research that showed that if when people didn't think that stress was bad for them, it didn't really have a bad effect on them. Yeah, uh, which is so weird, isn't it? Yeah. So you had this kind of interesting idea about making friends with stress, and I was I want to know how have you made friends with stress? Because mm. it's you know, kind of unavoidable, right? I mean, we all find yeah, stress in our lives. Yeah, no question. Um, and, you know, there have been things that have popped up even in the last year or two years that have been stressful things. Uh, I did some blood work. I'll give you a specific example. I did some blood work and it came back and I said, you have low iron, you have low hemoglobin, and you have a high erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Those three things the doctor basically said, and this was confirmed by two other doctors, they said you probably have some type of internal bleed going on in your life. And this created some stress for me. Not only was, you know, at, by the way, stress was likely a big part of what created that situation, but even hearing that news was a bit stressful. There's all these things that will pop up in our lives and, you know, life will hand us a curveball that we, you know, my, like my buddy Hal Elrod, who, who um, got, uh, you know, th is it now three years almost? Almost three years, he was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. One is a picture, right? Eating well and exercising and living a great lifestyle, you know, um, uh, all of a sudden, just, you know, seven days later, his whole body is failing and he's days away from possibly losing his life because he's, you know, and, and I think these stresses come our way. The way I deal with it is, that because I have the knowledge that stress doesn't have to be um, negative, like you cited in that study, people who just understood that when your heart starts pounding and your hands start sweating and you're a little nervous or whatever, that if you believe that you're getting stronger through that, if you believe that you're being given a signal, if you believe that you're given a sign, right? Because in that study, they talked about people giving a test. And, you know, when somebody says, look, you're, and I remember Tony Robbins telling the story, actually, he told it really well. He said, uh, I remember talking to somebody about going up on stage and they said, you know, I can't go on stage. And Tony said, why? And he said, well, my hands start to sweat and my heart starts to pound and my face turns red. And I just know at that moment, I'm way too stressed out to go on stage. And he said, I was having the same, I was having a conversation with Bruce Springsteen about when, when he was ready to go up on stage. Do, do you ever hear him tell this story? I have, but keep going. Yeah, yeah, That's good. yeah. So it's a, it's a great story for anybody who hasn't heard it. It's like, how, Bruce, how do you know that you're ready to go up on stage? And my hands start to sweat. My heart starts to pound. My face turns red. And at that moment, I know I'm ready. Those, those examples are exactly how we deal with stress. And that's how I try to do it. I don't do it gracefully at all times. I don't do it well all times, uh, at all times. But I am much better at recognizing that I'm in stress. I'm better at channeling that stress. I'm better at taking care of my body and my mind. I'm meditating more often. I'm running more often. I'm getting into natural sunlight. Like there's probably a hundred things you could do. And they're all the things that people are likely like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But we hear them and we know them, but we don't always do them. Right. Yeah. 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 Go out in sunlight. But yeah, I worked in my office all day yesterday. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Get some more it's sleep. Oh, I'm, you know, I yeah. only got four hours last night. Yeah, exactly. So now I've got the aura ring. It's right here. Look, mm -hmm. and I track my sleep and I'm interested. And it's like, oh, no big shocker that the month that I binge watched Game <laughs> of Thrones, I didn't sleep as well. But when you I think that's what people talk about when they talk about enlightenment or right that it, the lights are on enlightenment in a way for me just signals that I'm no longer kicking the the, the you know, the nightstand in the dark because I've managed to turn on the lights. And as a result of that, I, right, I can make better decisions when the lights are on. And sometimes having the lights on can be stressful. You're like, ah, I didn't know that it was so messy in here. Turn it off. Ignorance is bliss. Right. <laughs> right. But when, when we know that we can do something about it and then we have a strategy for getting it done, when we can move our way through one step at a time, we'll get there. So question number three, how do you personally balance achievement and fulfillment? Um, and or maybe is that even a false paradigm? Uh, I'm not sure. It's something I've been actually struggling with myself quite a bit uh, as as I'm getting towards the tail end of my 30s. Uh, and fulfillment seems more important than achievement did, especially compared to my 20s. I think if you're fulfilled in your achieve, in, in achieving, that's great. Some people do go through stages where their achievements are very fulfilling, right? You, you almost have to get to the top of the mountain to check that. Now, you might realize that after you do, um, that, there, that that same quest is no longer fulfilling, 
but getting there was. So um, I think that both are very important. And I think that we want to achieve, we want to progress as humans, and we also want to be fulfilled along the way. The, the real question is, how, what's the result? Are you? It, it's literally like I look at it like how I parent my kids. And, and you say, all right, there's all these debates, right? Is it public school? Is it private school? Um, I, I don't know what works for your kid, right? Is it achievement or is it fulfillment? I don't know what's working for you because if you're, if you're go, if you're chasing either of those two and it feels good, your, your body says yes, your mind says yes, the impact in the world that you're having is all screaming yes, then great. But I think we, we need to be just good at paying attention to the result and and do we like what we're getting and the more times that we can check in on that i mean i think that's why meditation works or that's why silence works or that's why going for a long walk will work because you just get a chance to take get get you know put your finger on the pulse and see how it's going so, so do, that's, you th do you think that uh it seems like the the ones who get to the highest achievement levels often that maybe we all recognize publicly are maybe tortured in some ways as well. Like they're almost trying to fill some hole, I wonder. Do, do you think that, uh, how, I mean, how do you balance that with kind of wanting to, you know, rule the world, but also, yeah. you know, be be happy yeah, at the same time? Absolutely, man. This is a big one. And I'll, I'll give you another real life example. I like talking about relevant real life examples. So in Front Row Dads, um, which is my for-profit business where I help high-performing entrepreneurial dads to be family men with businesses and not businessmen who happen to have families. Um, so in our Front Row Dads group, we have small groups called bands. So these are groups of, they're four guys, they meet monthly, and the idea is to create a really strong bond with three other men that you could talk with about, you could talk to them about anything. Well, I have a band um, that I'm in, and my buddy Hal, uh, who I spoke about earlier, is in our band, Hal Elrod, uh, my buddy Tim Nicolive, and another buddy Justin Donald. And we all live here in Austin, Texas. We meet once a month for two hours. Well, part of the goal of the band is to have real, genuine, honest, radically transparent conversations about how things are going in your life. The other part of the band, um, which Tim has really brought to the table, is about blind spots. It's about mm. catching people when they can't see it. And you've heard all the analogies of like can't read the bottle from, you know, you can't read the label from inside the bottle and all that stuff. And that's really what it's about. It's blind spots. And so you have people that know you. Um, they are paying attention. They can catch things when you don't. So I think that what, hap what happened three days ago, this is a real story, is we're sitting in an office in my buddy's home, and it's me and Tim and Hal, and we're talking about um, business and family and impact, and it's three hours, and we're whiteboarding, and we're asking questions like, what impact is, do you really want to have in the world? How do you measure that impact? Is it by revenue? Is it by number of lives that are saved? Is it how do you measure real success? And what type of lifestyle do you want? What do you want your days to look like? And as accomplished as the three guys that are in my band are incredibly accomplished, right? Literally, like financially, uh, with their impact in the world, these guys are megastars. Well, they're still all very interested in reevaluating what does success look like. And so we're sitting there with arguably a guy who has millions of dollars, has impacted millions of lives, and we're still having a conversation around what does success look like and what do you really want? And what does your heart say right now? These are the same conversations we were having a decade ago, yeah. right? And when and all the numbers were smaller. And all when that. all the numbers are smaller, we're having the same conversation. And by, it's so fascinating to me that we're having still significant breakthroughs in those conversations. And also what was really coming up at that was, hey, we'd ask the guy, what do you think? But then we'd also say, here's what I see. Here's the pattern I recognize. Like, or here's the incongruency. Like, you're saying you want this, but you're, you're doing this over here. And then the light bulbs are going off. Ah, oh, that's why I feel stressed out. That's why I'm chasing this thing because I think my impact is in the number of people. But really, my impact is over here, with, right? And that's, that, to me, that comes – the answer is this, small groups. I think the answer truly is like the power of having a few people that have your back that you can have genuine, radically transparent, co honest conversations with. Wow, that's great. Um, 
So <clears throat> question number four, one of the things that I love about the foundation is the the ability to make these moments that people never forget in their lives. Um, and sometimes I wonder if maybe that idea, we, we take it too seriously to the point where we end up feeling kind of paralyzed by it. Like we're, <laughs> you know, we're like, well, I can't make that big of an impact even in my yeah. family's life. Right. Or, yeah. um, but what are some tips that you have for making more and better moments that maybe don't set the bar so crazy high that, that, well, uh, that, you know, I will have an impact. I think you just said it, which is really great, is that sometimes the answer is lowering the bar. And look, I live a life of, of of raising the bar. I'm always asking, right? Like, how do we do more with less? And look, I've I've run ultra marathons. I'm asking myself, how do I, you know, I ran a 52.4 mile marathon. And the question was, how do I do more, right? What's, how do I set the bar higher? How do I find a new level? Yeah. I've also found as much um, meaning out of the question of how do I lower the bar? Mm. And what I mean by that is I used to think like here's a great example with kids taking your kids to Disney could seem like an epic moment. But I would argue that showing up for your kids every night, putting them in bed like here, I'll give you I'll give you two things. Right. So one is I took my kids to Russia for eight weeks last year with my wife and we did this whole adventure and it was epic. Right. That's one of those moments where you're like, damn, that's really setting the bar high. Yeah. My son, uh, my wife. Emily on a, a private jet to right where we're going to go. It's on a private jet. I'm sitting there with my 10 year old son. He's on a private jet. And I'm like, this is setting the bar pretty high. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is setting the bar pretty high. Um, but I also will tell you is that I think the real moments in life that are ones that we want to celebrate and the ones we want to stay connected to are like every single night I tickle my boys on their back. I rub their feet right? I, I spend time with them. They literally, they know this is, and, and here, here's my deal. Years ago, I used to be like, I used to be the dad that would say, if you misbehave, I would take away tickles. We call them tickles, right? I'll take away tickles. If you're not behaving, I'll take away tickles tonight. Or, Hey, you guys weren't behaving. There's no tickles tonight. Yeah. And so finally I realized that one of the things I can do is that I said, I will never, ever take away tickles, no matter how bad they've ever been. I will never take it away because I want them to know the very last thing is this, no matter what they do, no matter what they say, no matter how poorly they might have behaved, that they are always worthy of my love, that they are always worthy of me putting my hands on them and saying, this is how we're going to end the day. Out of love, with peace and quiet and calming and like, I'm just going to tickle your back because I don't care what you did. I love you and I'm always going to do this. And that was as much of a practice for me as anybody to be able to get mentally in the place where I could do that. Because basically, I, sometimes I'm like, screw you guys. I'm not, t I'm, yeah. right, I'm not. But here's the thing. I think that those moments are so incredibly powerful in their lives. And that's a, that's an easy moment. That's a, that's a repeatable moment. Those are traditions or rhythms or rituals, but that's lowering the bar. So, right. And I think that we need them all. I think we need the grand ones. I think we need the little ones. And I think we need to just recognize that our lives are a series of moments and how we choose to ch choose to treat each one is very important. Moments of forgiveness where you just let it go. Right. Um, that where you just let it go. That's a moment. That's a huge moment for some people. The most significant moment of their lives is when they let something go, when they stop blaming somebody else or blaming their old story or whatever. There's all these moments. But interestingly, like the discussion or the study around shaping moments or understanding moments, that's the fun part that we could spend 10 hours talking about. Right? Yeah. And I, I think about this as a parent a lot of times where. I, there are things from my childhood that I remember that I'm pretty sure were not wouldn't be moments my parents would think that were magical or or, yeah. or mattered. And yeah. and then I wonder often with my own kids, like how many of these things like I'm totally blind to the things they're going to remember or not. And so, yeah, yeah you just got to try to show up every day and I guess put in your best effort. <laughs> That's the biggest thing is showing up. And a, and a lot of this is look, intention's a part of it and actions another part. It's not just intention, but the intention is where it begins. It's like, hey, how can I be a moment maker for my kids today? How can I create a moment that uh, will be impactful? And they'll just be all on all these little tiny moments like my son's leaving for school today and I've got a really busy day and a gazillion things on my checklist and he says hey would you bike to school with me and my initial reaction it was the words were coming out of my mouth was I can't buddy I got so much on my plate and I was like yeah I can bike to school with you <laughs> yeah exactly like 
uh, I'll let one of those tasks go because I get to ride my bike. To, and then as soon as we pull out of the driveway, we see this, the moon and the sky and the clouds and we're biking and we're laughing and we're talking. And I'm like this, that was a decision, right? That was a moment. And, uh, yeah, I think we have lots of opportunities to create them. I'll give you another example, by the way, just because I believe in specific strategies of how we are moment makers. In our charity, we started something this last year, which we call fan mail. So when a recipient has their event, we are sending for all of our community is writing love letters, if you will. They don't even know the person, but they're just sending letters, right? Hey, I, I heard about your story. You're incredibly brave. We're sending you love from the Roman family in Austin, Texas. I've really come to appreciate the power of the written word. I've always appreciated it. It's always made a difference. I mean, I think about a letter I got when I was 16 from my uncle that made a big difference in my life. I've gotten cards. I keep every card I've ever gotten. Um, but I will tell you that I asked my parents one year, I said, look, rather than giving our kids more plastic toys with batteries, mm -hmm. uh, would you write them a letter? What I'd like to do is I'd like to have a book right? With dividers. And I want to store one letter every year for their life where they can just slide that letter in there and then look back on it and read it. And I will tell you those moments matter. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I did that one time. I wrote both of my boys a couple, like I was on a flight home and I just decided to handwrite them each little letters. And I think they're still taped up in their room. Like yeah. it, it, uh, it's, it's just cool to, I, I should probably do that again. <laughs> now that I think about it. It's been too long in between them. It is a good exercise, by the way, for all the dads or for any human to look back on your life and just ask yourself as a result of this interview today, just take a moment, give yourself a journal and some paper and just ask, what were the what were important moments in my life? They don't have to be epic. Right. But what, what were important moments? Was it that time that somebody wrote you that letter? Was it time that and by the way, some of the moments are tragic, but they're important. Right. Yeah. Like it was the time that this person broke up with me and taught me this lesson about life. It was the time I failed this thing that seemed like I was failing, but I was actually learning. Right. All those things about first we explore our own moments and then we try to figure out how to create them for others. So question number five, and this one is is probably the most personal one. Um, but I think based on the book and everything I know about you, that you've done a really good job of of minimizing potentially the big regrets, especially the ones that um you know, there was a palliative care nurse who wrote a book that that uh, chronicled like everyone's biggest regrets. Yeah. And it seems like, anywhere. yeah, so you've done a good job, I think, with her top five. But what uh, recognizing that regret is probably impossible to fully minimize. What do you think right now would, you're going to look back and would be one of your regrets? A lack of self awareness. Mm. As 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 aware as I think I am. And, you know, I, I'm reading and I'm meditating and I'm doing all the things that I think I need to do. There's a part of me that feels like uh, I may look back and regret some things that I've done because I didn't um, because I was unaware. Right. And I recognize that I'm trying to own that. Um, but I'm also wondering if there's a part of me that's attached to my reality and my story and that my ego is out of control and all these things. Like, I think that one thing I might regret is just saying, hey, I, 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 I missed a couple of things that didn't create an awareness that allowed me to truly thrive. So I have a little bit of fear around that. And I think there could be some regret there about selfishness, right? It's yeah. like, oh, I regret being selfish there or Right. It's kind of the catch 22, though, because if you if you knew, you know, then you'd be self-aware <laughs> right. about it and then it wouldn't be That's a problem. Right. And <laughs> Which is why one of the things I'm seeking out is tools or resources that help me to just feel more honest with myself. Mm. Right. Like one of my buddies, uh, Tim, who's in my band, gave me a book the other day called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. And it, it's a really good book. And we're talking about it. And he's like, oh, there's this thing in there called the drama triangle. And he was explaining to me this. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like now that I see that, like I'm totally part of the drama triangle. <laughs> right. And, and, and those moments are really powerful. But they also create this idea, this this knowing that, man, if that's missing in my life, what else might be missing? And I don't want to live in fear of it. I just want to have an awareness around it so that I can do something about it. Yeah. 
So bonus question that we always ask, and that is for a book recommendation um, over the, mm-hmm. uh, the one you just mentioned. <laughs> yeah. So the one that I always recommend and usually throws people because it's not what they're thinking is a book that was written years ago called The Ultra Marathon Men. And it's written by Dean Carnassus. And the book is, I think, about human potential. It's a really great story. Dean's such a cool dude. It's one of my favorite books of all time. It's sitting on the shelf behind me. And uh, I, I've got to tell you that that book transformed my world, not because I wanted to be a runner or because I was a runner at the time. It was because it was about a man chasing his dreams and finding his potential you know, or at least unveiling parts of it. Hmm. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Most, a lot of those stories that, uh, there's just so much more to draw out of it than, than some prescriptive, you know, like here's 15 steps to whatever, uh, you know, yeah. reading the real story about somebody and you learn a lot. That's, I love biographies for that reason. Sure. Yeah. Well, I see a little bit of myself in the story and then I, I'm inspired by what they do. I mean, I'm, I'm always inspired by people that make choices and take control of the meaning uh, of, of what their life is. You know, that, that, that concept that I think is well documented at this point of just, hey, life is happening all around you and it's up to us to decide, well, what does it mean? Yeah, I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing and with the foundation especially. And I think it's it's such an obviously positive force for the world. And, uh, you know, it's it's people like you who are making a big difference. So thank you for that. Mm. Hey, I want to I want to say thanks for having me on today, Jake. Um, really appreciate the questions. Appreciate what you're doing. Um, and also, uh, if I may, I just want to ask something from the audience as sure. well. And that is to just um, that when we think about our moments today and this idea of living in the moment, which I love and we talk about, I also want to think about the moments for the people that are in the next one, two, 10, 20, and 30 generations down the road. Um, I feel very strongly about the state of our planet right now and where we are. And I have some great concerns about what's happening, right? You know, when I read articles uh, and, and I read research about the fact that, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years, there'll be more uh, plastic in the ocean than there will be fish, right? When I think about the systems that we're building um, and the impact that it's having on the world, I, 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 you know, I feel compelled to want to play a role in making a change. So I feel like we all as a, you know, as a human race, if we don't make changes, I think we are facing the sixth, you know, great extinction right now. I think we can possibly turn it around, but we have to rally and we need everybody's participation um, to be able to create some radical changes in the way that we're living our lives, if not for ourselves, for our kids and for their kids. And that's that's my hope that all these conversations don't just build our businesses today and make us feel better about ourselves today, but that that we can do something that truly sets in motion positive ripples that help 10 generations and 20 generations down the road. Oh, that's beautiful. I think, um, you know, going back to kind of blind spots and, and uh, you know, I think that might be one that a lot of people, you know, they're focusing on making sure that their little tribe is doing okay and maybe losing track of some of the, how the bigger human tribe might be doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. Exactly. But we can do that. We can have that conversation and ask those questions and, and keep that top of mind so that we are conscious and aware of those things and make better decisions today. All right. So don't throw your garbage into the ocean, everybody. (laughs) That's right. Please (laughs) stop doing that. All right, John, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having me. Before you go, do me the huge honor of picking up your copy of The Rebel Allocator, available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. It's a business person's guide to effective capital allocation, told in a coming-of-age story of a college grad who crosses paths with a wealthy Midwesterner. It's fiction for the nonfiction reader. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to 5GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks. Happy reading.